Hi, I'm Jay Ramsey Sutter, and I have been asked and volunteered uh, to discuss how to follow a bill through the legislative process. And I don't know uh, everyone's level of, of knowledge about the legislature, so I was hoping to give an overview of the legislature, uh, and I can do that in another presentation. I realize that people are really interested in getting busy following legislation. So we're going to kind of start in the middle and talk about how to follow a bill or how to tr bill track or how to uh, uh, trace a bill through the legislative process. And there is a website uh, that's pretty easy to use and it is difficult to look at though. It, visually, it's, it's kind of cluttered and busy, but this is your state government in action and so uh, they didn't make this very user-friendly. But after we walk through it and talk about it a little bit, I think that it'll be something that won't be too difficult for you to use. There are also websites uh, that are professionally done uh, from the private sector that give you an opportunity to track legislation through there. What I'd like to see us do is be able to put together an app uh, that would include how to follow a bill uh, if we're able to get that up and running for members of uh, Pantsuit Republic. So let me walk you through how to track a bill, and I want you to feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, this uh, material is available. I will provide uh, website information for you and also some PDF information uh, about the whole process and how bill tracking fits in with it. So let me share my screen here with you and show you what we can look at together. This is the Texas Legislature's website, and if we go to the home page, you can see pretty readily that this is sort of um, uh, not graphically well done. It's difficult. It's cluttered. I even have my students try to uh, close it up and make it a little bit user-friendly so that they don't see quite so much and it doesn't uh, make them panic. But if, let's see, if you can see this, if you will go to home, you can see this is the home page for the te Texas Legislature Online, and it has information about the House right here and the Texas Senate here. And just for the basics, this is something that is kind of unique to the Texas Legislature. The Texas Senate is controlled by the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, and he is elected statewide. He does not, like the President and Vice President, run on a ticket with the Governor and the Lieutenant Governor. They run separately. The Texas Executive Branch may merit a discussion online uh, like we're doing now, uh, because it's unique. Uh, we have what's called a plural executive model and not a singular executive model. So this fellow has a lot more power than his counterpart on the federal level, um, Joe Biden. Uh, on the state level, the lieutenant governor actually controls the flow of legislation in the legislature. Nothing becomes law unless Mr. Patrick wants it to. And that's, that's typically the way the legislature has been run since the era known as Reconstruction after the Civil War. So if we back out of that and look at the Texas Senate, here's the members of the Texas Senate. There are only 31 of them, and they are elected from senatorial districts. And sometimes students have a difficult time remembering that these are different than our United States Senator. And so these folks just represent the state. Uh, and you can click through and take a look at uh, any of, of those folks. It will tell you what bills they have authored for this session, what bills they are sponsoring, what bills they co-authored and co-sponsored. Now, those are minor technicalities. They're really and truly members don't often write their own legislation. The Texas Legislative Council actually writes the legislation, and we'll come back and talk about that in a little while, but that's how you get the uniformity of the law, is that you have a group of lawyers known as the Texas Legislative Council sit down and actually write the bills. 
But these are the bills that Judith Zapparini, for example, has placed uh, under her authorship. In other words, she asked the Texas legislature, uh, I'm sorry, the Texas Legislative Council to write these bills for her. She provided research for them, uh, and they helped her draft the particular legal language that's used for the bills. Um, sponsoring means she signs on. Now, so far, since they're not in session, she hasn't looked at what her uh, fellow members have introduced, and so she hasn't signed on to sponsor anything yet. Um, she's not, obviously, a co-sponsor of anything, and she hasn't proposed any uh, constitutional amendments yet. And so we'll talk about what those things mean uh, in, a, in a little while. If you want to look over at the House, this is the Texas House of Representatives. There are 150 members of the Texas House, and they are led by Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss. And Mr. Strauss is not elected as part of the executive branch. Rather, he's elected as part of the legislative branch. And then once he hits Austin, he is elected by, this is the unique part, he's elected by uh, both Democrats and Republicans in the Texas legislature. Unlike the United States Congress's Speaker of the House, which is elected by the majority party. Mr. Strauss is elected by the good folks of San Antonio, and then when he hits Austin, he gets elected speaker by members of both parties. The interesting thing about the Texas House and Senate is that we don't have majority parties or minority parties there. What we have uh, is simply a collaboration. They work together. Why? Because it used to be all Democratic after the Civil War. It wasn't until the 1960s that we actually had people elected as Republicans. And we can talk about the history of parties in, a, in another, another webinar, but that just gives you some idea. You're not going to have a majority leader. You're not going to have a minority leader. Truly, the Texas Speaker of the House and the Texas Lieutenant Governor actually control the flow of business in the legislature. And nothing becomes law unless they want it to. And that's a pretty interesting aspect of all of this. What we're looking at in the next 140 days is really a formality. It's theater. What's going to pass, what's not going to pass, has pretty much well already been decided by the agendas of the House and the Senate leadership. Let's look here at what we have uh, available in the Texas House. Here is a list of the members, those 150 members, and you can click on each of these and it will give you information again about the bills authored and that kind of thing. Uh, if you go to committees, uh, the committees have not been assigned yet in the legislature, which means they haven't actually decided what committees they're going to have this session. That's done session by session. There are some committees that you can expect to be there, um, and those are your standard committees, like committees on agriculture and things like that, but they really vote on what, what committees are going to exist um, each session. This gives you some idea. If I click on committees, they talk about committee dates, uh, meetings held by committees, where upcoming me meetings, so you know that uh, transportation is going to have a public hearing um, uh, in the near future. You can look over in the Senate. Senate hasn't established their committees yet, but if you click on that, you can see that um, there, the, the holes in the um, web page are ready for those committee assignments. Upcoming committees, uh, no committees yet have been scheduled. They're not quite ready to do that yet. Uh, committee membership, you can take a look at the House members by name and see what committees uh, they're going to be assigned to. See, notice they haven't made those assignments yet. That's really the responsibility of the Speaker in the House to make those committee assignments. And yes, they're done by seniority. They're also done by um, what particular districts need to cope with. If you had a district that was located in Galveston, 
they would be considered with port issues and security issues of that port, maybe infrastructure of that port. So that's what the committees would deal with. And, of course, here's a window to show you how to look up committee membership. But it's a little early yet to do that. So if we look at My Texas Legislature online, give you a list of bills that can be filed. You enter in your email address, tell it to remember you, and create a password. You can look up then a list of bills created by manually entering the number or adding the number from a bill history page. You can receive email notification about when bills are going to be available. If you want to look up the text of a bill or text search, this is where this aspect of this comes in handy. It will help you. How do I find a list of filed bills? This will give you information about that. And I'd like to walk through this with you in just a moment. A list of filed bills can be obtained through the following steps. Select the reports link underneath additional searches from the home page and select the general reports tab. And then the following reports consist of bills filed for specific legislative sessions, the House bills and the Senate bills. But we'll come back to that. Don't fret. We'll get there. If you want to track a bill or follow the status of a bill, you can look here as well. How do I find a hard copy of the bill? You can always print one on your own. You can use the Texas legislative system online to follow a bill through the entire legislative process. And here's a little guide, and I've copied the link and put the link on Slack so that everybody can download this link and print it. And it is full of a lot of jargon and a little bit difficult to get through with that regard. But I think we'll be able to work on this together and clear up some of your questions about the legislative process. But filing a bill, let me say this. When members file a bill, all they need to do is actually walk into the chief clerk's office of the House with 11 copies of your bill, and you give those copies to the bill to the chief clerk. The clerk then assigns that bill a number. And the numbers are not particularly important. They're not special. They do reserve, say, the first 20 bills for the speaker so that he can put his agenda into those first 20 bills. The lieutenant governor has the same privilege in the Senate. So the first 20 bills will tell you that that's their legislative agenda. Secondly, they just assign the bill a number based on walking in the door with that bill. So they're just filed in numerical order. When they're introduced on the floor, the chief clerk is there and assigns those based on what the speaker or the lieutenant governor tells them, assigns them to a committee. And you can tell a great deal about those as legislative priorities. If they get assigned to the proper committee, that may indicate to you that the speaker is actually going to treat that bill as a legitimate bill. If they wanted to bury that bill so it would never come up for a debate or discussion, that's sort of done through the committee chairmanship. Committee chairs are picked by the speaker and the lieutenant governor. And they're done so in a bipartisan way. It's not unusual for there to be Democrats as chairs of committee, even though they're the minority party. But remember, they're not talked about in terms of a minority party. We don't have minority leaders. We don't have majority leaders because really all the flow of business is controlled by the speaker. There are calendars committee that after that bill comes out of committee, it's placed on a calendar. And there are a few calendars that are available so that we have some order to the way that these bills are brought up for 
uh, discussion. But back to, back to tracking the bill. How to follow a bill? Here we go. Below are the basic steps involved in passing a bill into law. Links to information available on the Texas Legislature online are provided to aid in the following steps. So take a look at this sheet, if you will. And like I said, it's not visually very helpful at all. Uh, and I think okay. you can come up with something that works a lot better. Hey, Jay. During the legislative session, members may introduce new legislation until filing deadlines are identified. And they will usually accept bills right up until March. Pre-filing of bills started November 1st. When the legislature is in session, the Texas Legislature online homepage will include the time that the House and the Senate are scheduled to convene each day. And sometimes they don't get started until 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they don't get started until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That does not mean that committees are not in session. And I kind of want to let people know that if you're interested in dropping by your state representative's office, they're not there. Their staff is there, uh, and their staff is a minimum because they're giving a, given a very small budget to maintain that staff. But normally a member of the legislature is in committee uh, or on the floor. Uh, they're, they're not always... Uh, readily available to entertain guests, if you will. And so it's pretty important that if you want to go by and talk to your uh, member of the legislature, the House or the Senate, you need to make an appointment to do that. And if you go in there as an individual, the chances of you seeing somebody on your own uh, is very small. They derive a lot of power by gatekeeping, by keeping people at arm's length and saying, I'm sorry, I can't see you today, or I'm sorry, you can't make an appointment, they're booked. The reason they're booked is because they are in committee meetings, and those committee meetings are often stacked right on top of each other. Um, they're always perpetually late, always running to catch up. And if they're not in committee, then they're on the floor uh, voting. And so it's very difficult to get in there. It's important for us to think about not going in as, as individual lobbyists, but rather going represent, representing rather uh, Pansuit Republic, because that way we are having the force of people go in with us as opposed to people trying to go in as individuals. It's not conducive uh, to getting to see anybody. But let's go back and take a look at this uh, Pro, uh, the, the process of tracking bills. Um, you can look at legislative reports, which will give you the bill's text, nothing's come down today, uh, the bill's analysis, which by the way, that is very important. That gives you some idea about what people hope to see and do uh, with a piece of legislation. Um, Bills that have been filed by the House. Here we go. Notice that that starts at 41. That tells me that about 40 bills have been reserved by the speaker for the speaker's agenda, things that they want to accomplish. And the caption of the bill, and all bills start out the same way. If we want to click on House Bill 41, um, it can tell us, uh, where it is and what subjects, by the way, these these would be the phrases that you might want to enter into search so that you could find any bills related to that. Um, add to bill list. If we wanted to track that bill, we could click right there and it would establish us uh, a way of tracking the bill. Here's the text of the bill and notice that it comes to you as a PDF or a Word document. Um, it also comes to you in this form, which is a little difficult to read, uh, but you can back up and look at this as a Word document. There it goes to download. I'll click it and it'll come right, right up. I say that, but there you are. Click on that, and the bill should open up for us. It may take it a second. You can also look at it as a PDF. All bills begin this way. 
they all start with this, this part is known as a caption. A bill to be enacted, an act relating to the sale of fireworks on and before the Juneteenth holiday. And you can scroll through here. It'll tell you what code it's under. And I'll show you how to look up laws uh, in the existing code. Um, and there are several codes, but, but I can show you how to look up anything in existence. The language of this bill was developed probably by the Legislative Council. That's how we know that it sounds like a piece of legislation, that it reads the same way that Texas law reads. So that just gives you an idea about what the bill looks like and where, where to acquire them. They're a text, tell you who the authors are. Those are the people who actually filed the bill. It doesn't necessarily mean they wrote the bill. The caption relating to the sale of fireworks on or before Juneteenth. And to, to give you some idea about the procedural aspects of this, there is a rule that nothing can become law in Texas until it's been read on the floor three times. They don't read the entire caption. I, I misspoke, strike that. They don't read the entire body of the legislation. It's not practical to do that today. But when that rule originated, many members of the Texas legislature could not read. They did not have a formal education. And so we require all bills to be read on the floor so that people know what they're voting for. The practical matter is today, they don't read the entire bill. Rather, they read merely the caption of the bill. That little sentence. Sometimes they're three sentences long. And you can just look things up according to the captions. Now, bill stages. This says to us that the bill has been filed. It does not tell us which committee it's gone to because it hasn't yet been sent to a committee. So we're not, we're not seeing any committee action on it. And um, it just says that the bill has been filed. The purple there tells us that the bill has not reached any of these stages in the process yet. Okay. Um, now there, there are diagrams and I'll print these for you, but I'm not this kind of learner, and when I see these diagrams, I get just vertigo. I, th I find them very difficult to understand and to read. I'm the kind of person that has to learn by uh, paragraphs of type, uh, paragraphs written in my native language. And so when I see something like this diagram that's in the Guide to the Texas Legislature, I get overwhelmed, y'all. I find this... Um, really difficult to use. The legislative process for House bills and resolutions. This looks worse than a Texas Highway Department map of the state. Uh, I find it very, very difficult to use. Now, I can walk you through each part of that, but that's probably a different webinar altogether. Let's back up and go back to our, uh, here's a list of the bills that have been filed so far. And if we scrolled all the way down, you can tell um, that, uh, by the way, if you'll notice, the bills are not in numerical order. They are in the order in which they were filed. But these, these bills were, these are resolutions, House Resolution. That's what HR stands for. HJR stands for House Joint Resolutions, which means the Senate has filed a companion resolution word for word identical. And it has to be that way because they must pass in identical form. Okay? A resolution, by the way, does not require any uh, executive action whatsoever. And resolutions don't have the force of law. They are, they are for constitutional amendments, or they might be a commemorative kind of bill, like in memory of Betty Ann Payton of Hondo or in memory of Joe Benham from Kerrville, somebody who gave service to the state, somebody who their representative thought it would be nice to commemorate 
uh, for whatever reason. If your mom and dad are having their 60th wedding anniversary, you can get your member of the legislature to pass a resolution commemorating uh, your mom and dad's uh, wedding anniversary. Once there was a legislator from Waco, his name was Tom Moore, and Moore wanted to show that the legislature often votes on things that they have no idea what they mean, but they'll vote on them and pass them even though they don't know what they are. Tom introduced a bill commemorating the population control efforts of one Tony DeSalvo. Those of you who are a little bit older will know that Tony DeSalvo was the Boston Strangler. And Tom Moore was passing legislation commemorating his uh, killing spree. He did that just to show that the legislature pays no attention to what they pass uh, in terms of these resolutions. So if we uh, scroll up, if I can get this little guy to cooperate here with me, um, those are the bills that have been filed so far. And you notice that the bill numbers are already HB stands for House Bill. And by the way, through the process, it's going to maintain that prefix. It's always going to be called House Bill. Uh, bills that originate in the Senate are always going to be called Senate Bills. So let's move up through our bill tracking. And if we want to find out on that original page, let's go back to our very original page, Let's say that we want to find out how many bills have been filed that deal with women. So I'm going to type the, the word woman in there, or women in there. And so far we have eight bills. And we can sort them by number if we'd like. There we go. And it tells us bills that affect women. And so we can earmark those and keep an eye on those throughout the legislative session. And it will give us the bill text, give us, give us the introduced version, because as you all know, when this bill gets to committee, it will go through a process known as markup. And when a bill is marked up, that means any changes that the committee recommends to that bill will be applied to that bill. So uh, here's a bill, introduced version, bill text from Representative Springer relating to designating October 19th as Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. Here's another bill uh, regarding Brave Day, uh, dealing with breast restoration advocacy and education. Um, proposing a constitutional amendment. Notice the bill number is different. House Joint Resolution. Constitutional amendment proposals have to pass both the House and the Senate before they make it to the ballot for Texas voters to pass or reject. Uh, and that's a little bit different. We don't do United States constitutional amendments that way, but we do Texas legislature amendments that way. Relating to the regulation of raw milk, relating to the dis dis distribution, possession, purchase, consumption, and receipt of cigarettes, e-cigarettes, tobacco products, and providing penalties for probably selling those to a minor. I would think that would be what that bill was about. Here we go. Relating to the disposition of an unborn child's remains after an abortion. And if you notice something, notice the emotional language in the caption of the bill. Notice that it says unborn child's remains. Notice that it doesn't say fetus or fetal remains. Clearly, this is pushing people right here with this word child. You're clearly pushing people uh, to adopt a position or to be pulled into the orbit by the gravity of that word, that word child. It's going to be very difficult for members to say, I'm opposed to uh, this piece of legislation when people are going to be referring to it as a child and not fetal material. Uh, that's, a, that's a manipulative kind of thing. It's not really the language of law. Uh, it's not really objective. But clearly, objectivity is not in the interest of those who are supporting uh, this piece of legislation. And so let's, let's take a little look at uh, this legislation, because it might be something that you really want uh, to track. Notice that it indicates that it knew we were looking for the word woman. Uh, that's We typed that in. We typed in search 
and that's why it went uh, and highlighted that term. And you can look throughout the, the legislation, and that term may show up. Ah, see, there it is again, uh, right there, women. Uh, so uh, we can study. This might be worth a webinar within itself to take a look at what this legislation seeks to do and what are the chances of passing it. It's going to go into the health and safety code. This is a piggyback attempt to cover Governor Abbott. Abbott has already uh, proposed this piece of legislation as a rule. It's not yet a state law, but because he's the executive, he can issue executive orders or rules to direct state agencies directly under the governor's control, and that's what he's done. He's, he's taken a rule, and someone is interested, uh, Representative Huffines is interested in uh, making this law and putting it in the uh, health and safety code. So uh, there we find it. Um, I'm sorry, technical. There we go, technical problem. Um, so it's it's talking about uh, making a law which essentially uh, the governor has already issued as a ruling. Now, an attorney general that was independent of the governor might say in an attorney general opinion that the governor has perhaps overstepped his constitutional authority by issuing a rule where a law would be more in keeping with the Texas Constitution. But they've got him covered by somebody sponsoring legislation that essentially uh, does that. So if we back out of here, um, calendars here will tell us when things are going to come up for a debate or discussion, and so far we don't we don't have that. If you want to search for a particular kind of bill, you can search by author or sponsor of that legislation or subject criteria, uh, if we wanted to, to, to go there. And it gives you a really nice list of everything and anything that a piece of legislation might want to cover. So if we scroll right on down, there's women. And we can put that over there. And we can begin, our, begin a search. And if women aren't seen as a subject, but maybe a part of it, let me check if we can find it this way, if just by typing it in. We might try keywords. Women's health programs, women's shelters. We can add all of this over and see what kind of legislation comes up. See if we can search that way. There you go. And you know, don't hesitate to play around with this website. You can't break it. You can't hurt it. And it's not going to make a lot of sense until you actually get hands on and, and play with it a little bit. No wonder people use services to track bills because it's a lot easier. But I think it's important to involve members in, in being able to look at these bills themselves and find the bills themselves uh, because that can be uh, quite useful. It, it helps people feel involved. It gives people a hands-on approach to looking at legislation and understanding the legislative process uh, a lot better. Uh, so that can be really useful for us uh, to do that. Let me go back here. And um, if you want to look at My Texas Legislature Online, the bill list here, you can create a list of bills that you would like to watch. Each time you run the list, the bill information is updated. You can set alerts for bills to tell you, aha, this bill is going before this committee. Aha, they're hearing testimony today before that committee. Your saved searches are right there. And mobile device support, learn how to obtain four calendars and agendas, committee meeting notices, committee membership, all of that is available on a mobile version. You enter this into your mobile advice, uh, device on the browser. In addition, some mobile devices may have live chamber proceedings. 
they actually live stream the Texas legislature on the floor. And it is quite different from listening to the United States Congress. One session, I remember vividly that someone proposed legislation to allow members to carry guns on the floor. At least cooler heads prevailed because I myself have witnessed this fights break out on the floor. So it can be kind of a rollicking uh, place. And then there are RSS feeds, a little older technology there, but it helps you uh, keep up with what's available. Well, I have been yakking away, and so I was wondering if, I, if there are any questions out there uh, amongst listeners, um, if I can help anybody uh, with anything that, that we've just talked about. Are there any questions from anyone? Hey, Jay, it's Dion. Hey, nice to um, visit I with you. I have a question. Uh, so we use the search term woman or women. Do we need to be extremely specific and explicit? Do we need to go back and look at, say, um, the different way that that different ways that that comes up? Girls also. You, that I would thing? definitely type in girls. And I'm going to do so right now and see what uh, develops. But I think that that's a very wise thing. Um, youth, now nothing came up specifically with girls yet, uh, but youth might be a word that you would find. Yes, youth pops up a lot, and that has to do with the Texas Youth Commission. Um, but it also includes things like uh public or private youth centers and the regulation of child safety zones. Uh, so youth, child, safety, you really have to develop a good sense, and I think you do it after you have played around with the language a little bit, of how they list these things. Uh, in the law, there are actual books that help you develop a kind of internal index so that you can readily find what you're looking for in, in legal resources. But, uh, and I can help, help us develop something like that too, that it would be appropriate to look up youth, uh, boys, girls, safety, um, uh, regulations, um, that kind of thing. Juvenile justice, that would be important to look under that way. Uh, so, uh, maybe that would be an appropriate uh, an appropriate way of finding that information. That's a really good question. There's kind of a vocabulary that we have to develop uh, as as we look up the bills. Let me show you the feature that will allow you to take a look at what's going on on the floor. If you look, there's the mobile version of the TLO so that you can put that on your iPhone or iPad or uh, any other available uh, telephone or um, mini computer. Video broadcast, if you click on that, you can see the house live broadcast. Obviously nothing going on yet, uh, but today's filed bills, they'll give you a list of that. The chief clerk's office generates that. End of session deadlines. Here's a calendar that kind of tell us where we're going. And frankly, y'all, they don't really get serious about stuff until about March. Uh, they are just like the rest of us. They like to procrastinate. And so by March, things get very hectic there. They will hang on to uh, the allotted time. Uh, if they were going down to the wire where I have seen them pass hundreds of bills within a few moments, uh, literally within a few minutes, uh, passing hundreds of bills, um, you might uh, notice that they have done things like unplug the clock so that they can keep going after the deadline uh, and finish up what pending business they have. But literally hundreds of bills will be passed in that last week. Uh, if they don't make it out of committee, by April, that bill's really going to be dead. Uh, it's not going anywhere in the in the legislative session. Uh, are, are you, do you have another question? Jay, I actually have a question. This is Tanvi. Hi, nice to see you. 
Yes. Uh, so I was reading something about public hearings. I don't know if you already went over this part, but oh, uh, please. the public hearings, is that a good time for the pantsuit group to be present in Austin to speak towards any of the bills that we're interested in? Yes, and what you need to do in order to get on the agenda to speak about a bill. Notice here there is a window. Can, can you see my page uh, for the, the legislature online? Yep. Let me make sure that, that you can. I think you can. Yes, we can see. Testifying at a House committee hearing. Mm -hmm. Right on that. And scrolling down, how do I testify at a House committee hearing? Electronic uh, registration has been implemented as a requirement for providing testimony at House committee hearings. Woohoo, yippee, that is a good idea. See the House Witness Registration website for more information. And so here we can register to, to appear before hearings and testify about them. The most effective testimony comes from people who've actually experienced the problem that the committee is trying to address with that legislation. So if it was a hearing about education and the availability of special teachers for uh, particularly or differently challenged students, a parent would want to go talk about that. Uh, and, and testifying, uh, you can have packed committee hearing rooms or you can have no one there. Um, it's catch as you can, uh, but that would be an excellent way. Also, contacting a member, your particular state uh, rep or senator, uh, contacting that member and saying, I'd like to offer my testimony. I've been through this, and I would like to offer my experience to the committee. And that's a very good way of doing that. Also, talking to the chair of that committee or that chair committee staff, I should say, so that they can get you on. Talking to the committee staff. Now, that's two separate things, by the way. Members have their own staffs, but committees have their own staffs, too. And so it's a good idea for us to know people that serve the committee. You, we can do this electronic registration. That's nice, but there's nothing like the human touch. There's nothing like being in direct contact with people when we need to testify. And that's the most effective way to go about it. That way you get on the record. The press covers that. That's a little bit more effective than going by the office because frankly, they are so busy, they're not going to see you. Uh, their staff will see you, uh, but a member won't see you. But that member will see you before that committee. And press covers that, and then that makes you available to talk to the press as well. And those things are covered uh, on on uh, at the uh, legislative access uh, live streaming too. Okay, great. Might be helpful to to us to as we think about an effective strategy uh, for for uh, lobbying. Hey Jay, it's Dion again. I have another question. So um, as we are all, you know, members of Pantsuit Republic, uh, we are obviously very concerned about the fetal remains bill that we, that you highlighted. And um, I know that they conveniently held a, a committee hearing the day, the, the morning after the election, the general presidential election, knowing that people would not show up, right. they would be too busy either with other things, celebrating or mourning, however you want to look at it, to not show up and testify. And so do you do we know if there's going to be any more committee hearings um, or opportunities to get in front of a committee before this goes before the House? I, I don't know that. But I would imagine so because they have to at least have the appearance of having heard people uh, because that gives them credibility. They can say we heard people. But, but remember, even over people's objections, the governor's office came up with this rule. 
Right. Uh, even though people had said this is a really bad idea, this is this is not something that people want to engage in, they they pushed forward with it. And the reason that they went with it as a rule to begin with is once the giant machinery of of government agencies move in that direction, mm -hmm. it's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier. Yes. Right. Once you're committed, you can't get out of that lane of traffic. You're going to make that turn, and once you make that turn, it's almost impossible to come back from that turn. If, if I were to give an opinion about how to approach this, I would say that the best thing we can hope for, and I don't like to concede defeat, but the best thing we could hope for is to make enough noise and make enough public awareness that it appears that we are not going to go down without a fight and that we are going to be static, that we're not going to take this calm and uh, uh, respectfully, that you know whatever we need to do to get public awareness raised about this issue uh, is tremendously important. Uh, but the governor seems quite committed by putting the power of the governor's office in motion before there's even legislation about this. Uh, that tells me that they want to move the ship of state uh, quickly in that direction and want very little resistance to it. And that's the key, uh, putting up as much resistance as we can. Surprise, Jay. It's on. Just real quick to piggyback on this, Jay, what you're talking about here, the least resistance piece, how can we make the most resistance? How can we make it harder for Abbott? Oddly enough, government is not um, immune to visual. As much as government is language and words, we need to speak a different language to the Texas uh, legislature and to the governor than they're accustomed to hearing. Um, women in the state have traditionally uh, taken a back seat have traditionally not made a muss or a fuss. We don't want to get our hair messed up, you know. No, it's time to get your hair messed up and take your pearls off and get in the ditch uh, and fight. I think it has to be very visual. Even though uh, House Bill 2 that dealt with uh, restrictions on abortion clinics passed, it didn't pass without that rotunda filled with angry women who were vocal, who, who caused a commotion, if you will, who caused uh, people to take a look at this in a way that, that the press was forced to cover it. Uh, I think it's important to make a visual noise. That way the press has to put you on camera. It's news when there are hundreds of women standing in the Texas Capitol in the rotunda uh, and saying, we're, we're not happy about this. Uh, the bill passed anyway. But that visual is still with us in our collective consciousness. And that bill ultimately went to the Supreme Court. Um, this is a different tact. I'm not sure that we're talking about a constitutional issue yet. Um, I, I'm concerned that there may be some due process uh, concerns in this. There may be. Uh, in the language, something that will trigger a constitutional fight. Uh, but for now, just the shock of what the bill requires people to do when they've suffered a miscarriage uh, or uh, have, have had uh, an elective abortion, uh, what, what has to take place? And, and some of this is quite early in a pregnancy. So it's important for people to think about a visual strategy, I think, uh, to address this problem. Because it's difficult when somebody's talking about this on the news just to be a talking head and not get the import of what's really being requested. So we have to be visual. We have to be able to get a script down and talk about this in an articulate way uh, because you have about seven seconds on camera uh, if you're talking to a reporter uh, to deal with this. So let's think about the visual uh, and, and how to protest. I really think it's important to testify before committee if 
uh, we, we'll look at where this is referred, probably uh, uh, to Health uh, and uh, Human Services Committee, um, probably to committees on um, regulation. We'll find out what committees and prepare uh, testimony and witnesses for that as well. Does that sound like something that you would be interested in doing? Are you speaking directly to me? This is Tanvi. Anyone? Anyone who wanted to speak to it? Yes, definitely. I think that's what we're all interested in uh, doing. I have a quick question to circle back to that committee hearing that was the morning after the general presidential election. Is there a way to get a copy of what was said or to note how many people testified or anything, any kind of information like that so we can see what the turnout was? I, I think we can. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to type in fetal remains. There was a bill filed by Cook regarding that. Let me see if I can show that. Can you see it? No. Okay. okay that, that may be me. Let me see. Let me go back. I'm still working out the technology here. Here is House Bill 201, and it talks about fetal remains. And let me see about the history of the bill. Um, it was introduced, House Committee Report engrossed, Senate Committee Report enrolled. There has been a fiscal note and a bill analysis done. This has really moved very quickly. Um, so let me see what I can find regarding. I'm going to start a Let me see if I can create a search here. Let's see. Will it let me? It may be an old email address that it still remembers. Yeah, the email does not have an account, so re-enter or select a new user to create an account. That's what I'll do. Okay. New user. Ah, there we go. Oh, and I, software has to be configured for this. This might be something we might want to set up later, but I think that I can um, see what committee met upcoming meetings for date, view committees for a specific date. I'm going to back up to the election. See, I don't see that there was a meeting, but let's see what happened on the 14th. There was an ethics committee meeting, the 16th county affairs, the 21st juvenile justice. The 1st of December, insurance, of course. The 7th, transportation. So I'm not finding a, a meeting for that specific piece of legislation. Perhaps these were other committee meetings. That's really interesting because it was the House, uh, what was it, the Health and Services or what health? Yeah, health and Human Services, perhaps. Yes, because um, when I was at the NOW meeting last month, they had put out, like, it was basically the um, formal email about the uh, right, committee the meeting. Right, the rule that went to state agencies. Yeah. I, well, you know, 
somehow or another that just didn't get put on a calendar, did it? Fancy that. Fancy that, because, you know, alert people watch for these things all the time, and that would be something that now would have been very interesting, interested in. Um, so th let me do a little digging, and I will find out where that... Ah, oh, see, there's my old account. Does um, that speak to the due out. diligence or whatever you were speaking about earlier about the fact, you know, that um, I don't think diligence is what you, the word that you, the term that you used, but speaking to the idea that it has to be fair and everyone has to be heard, could that be a perhaps a, a point of contention that it wasn't listed on the website, it wasn't publicized, so therefore how could you have heard everyone speak to make this rule? I think that's an important point and, and something that I would definitely pencil into some notes about this process because we may find that, that we, we need to uh, request a hearing if, if uh, that's the case. And uh, I think that's certainly appropriate for agencies that would be affected by this and it certainly would be for interest groups like now Planned Parenthood and Pantsuit Republic to say we'd like to have a hearing about this, we have questions about the bill. There is a NOW meeting Sunday, um, and I'm going to it, so I will follow up with that, and I'll let everybody know what I find out um, and see what they know about the committee, if the committee actually met. Okay, and I have friends with NOW in Houston, uh, and so I will, will send them an email as well and, and see what I can find out. Happy to do it. Thank you. Hey, Jay? Yes. This is Tanya. Hi. Um, I'm just kind of interested. Hi there. I'm kind of interested in the machinations that are put into place when um, it's pretty clear that something will pass the legislature that will then have to be decided in another court or at another level. How soon does that start? And uh, what are the steps for that? Well, if, if they pass a piece of legislation that, that is controversial, that angers uh, potential plaintiffs, we really cannot file suit unless we have been personally harmed by that piece of legislation, by that new law. Now, once a piece of legislation passes, arrives at the governor's desk for the governor's signature there at the end of May, first part of June. Bills don't become law normally for 90 days unless it was placed on an emergency calendar. If it's an emergency, that time period can, can be reduced. But we have 90 days before that bill takes, an, takes effect. We can't sue until it becomes law and a person has to be directly impacted by that new law before they have standing to sue. That doesn't mean that you can't be looking for a test case. That doesn't mean that, that you're not going to have people harmed, but you have to allow that to take place before there is standing to sue. Does that help? Yes, it does, because um, being in Texas, there's going to be some things that are out of our control yes, at this stage of the game, but I would, I'm interested to know how we go about uh, mitigating it after it's passed. You know, that's, that's a fascinating question, and that's why interest groups are so important, because there is discussion about how to mitigate the reality of a piece of legislation. There is often a gap between the ideal piece of legislation and how that piece of legislation actually um, actually worked. Um, that there's a there's a gap between what they intend to do and the actual mechanics of how that piece of legislation uh, works in the real world. Um, and how state agencies are actually going to implement that law. Now, we can read 
what are called fiscal notes, and they're no normally done by the comptroller's office. The fiscal notes tell us how expensive something is going to be, right down to the bare bones of you're going to have to have 14 new uh, buildings rented, you're going to have to have X number of employees, you need to buy computers for all those employees. You know, it really gets down to the cost of that piece of legislation. Where we can mitigate early is in the markup process. When a bill goes to committee and that committee hears testimony about that piece of legislation, let's say, for instance, that there are several bills filed that seek to do basically the same thing. Those bills will all go to the same committee and the committee may consolidate all of that legislation into one bill. It's a process called markup and I want you to think about it in terms that they literally get out a pencil, draw lines through language, rewrite that language, uh, and, and frankly, y'all, sometimes language fails us. Sometimes language cannot accomplish, there's a disconnect between what people have in their mind and what actually happens on that piece of paper. And, and so where we can have impact is through testimony, is through having stories, having people go before that committee and say, this was my experience, for instance, with miscarriage, or this was my experience with uh, abortion. Uh, this is my experience with the inavailability of birth control, um, wh whatever the experience might be, because if you can put a human face on it, you have a much better opportunity to mitigate what actually gets written into that bill. They may actually get pressure from people seeing that testimony if the news will cover that testimony, and that's where the importance of press releases come from, uh, telling the media that there was testimony today about a particular uh, set of circumstances, uh, because the legislature is big. It's very difficult to cover, and there aren't that many people covering the legislature. Uh, so it's very important to get that story out and get that story in the press's hands so that they can get that videotape and you can have a visual uh, for the six o'clock news and reach more people with it. And so to hammer home the point of it shouldn't be called unborn child's remains, it should be called fetal remains. If they get I enough, prefer fetal uh, remains because that's what yeah. they are. Uh, right. so unborn they enough, child is an emotional, uh, very, and for some people, uh, they consider that an unborn child. But actually, the legal definition in Texas of a life in being uh, is, is that first breath that a delivered infant can take on their own. That qualifies that person as a live birth. Um, but but yeah. before that... In the stages of fetal development, from embryonic cells uh, to fetus, uh, before that ninth month of gestation, uh, technically, legally, medically, you're talking about fetal remains. Yes, yeah, so then if we could hammer home the point that do not call this an unborn child, call it what it is, fetal remains, at some point, maybe during markup, there would be enough pressure to change it from unborn child remains to fetal remains. And we have to approach people on committee individually who would be friendly to introduce a change like that. There may be somebody on that committee who can hear what we're actually saying and won't fall victim of setting themselves up to, you know, people on the far right are going to say, that's an unborn child. We need to call it that. And, and they will just defy anyone saying that there'll be repercussions to that person if they vote against the preservation or the burial of the remains of an unborn child. Yeah, those words are so much more emotional, right? That's insane. That's the Texas legislature. Oh. It can often be a violent, crude, 
unwieldy, rollicking place where many people who are not in the majority culture will feel violated simply by the language in the law. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that y'all picked up on that. Well, Jay, thank you so very much for providing us with this education. I think that tons of people you're going to affect change with tons of uh, pant suitors in Texas, and we couldn't be so couldn't be more pleased and proud that you've joined us and are part of our leadership team. And so we'd love to do more th more of these with you. Absolutely, Absolutely. anytime. Uh, and whenever you have a suggestion about what you would like to see, by all means, please let me know. And you can't uh, you can't know how satisfying and how much I appreciate being a part of such a talented and outstanding group of men and women. Oh, thank you. Well, thank and you. also to anybody who's watching this later on, if since we're taping it, if you guys have questions, right, we can ask people to write in. Absolutely. Uh, anybody uh, that wants my email, uh, use my email account. It's the letter J R S U T T E R at Mac M A C dot com. Thank you so good. much. You're amazing, and we look forward to doing any more educational series with you. Great. Right. Y'all are very Absolutely. welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.